talks. We've got Thursday from 10 to 12, Dave Glass and Node.js lead TJ Fontaine coming. Next week, Wednesday, we've got uh, some folks from Google coming to talk about Polymer. Uh, that starts at 1, same room here. Um, Thursday's talk is across the street in buildings 9 and 10. Uh, building E, classrooms 9 and 10, sorry. Um, I'm Matt Sweeney. I work with the Front End Working Group here, which is kind of a new initiative we've been working on to examine existing and emerging standards and practices. So along those lines, we've invited Pete to come talk about Facebook's React project and let us know kind of what they're doing there. And we heard it was pretty interesting, so we wanted to make sure that there was uh, things going on we wanted to hear about. So here he is, Pete Hunt. He's the uh, he's the lead um, manager for the Instagram web team and a member of the Facebook core React team. So yeah. I'll let Pete take it away. Thanks. Awesome. Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, quick check: Has anybody looked at React at all before? Okay, that's that's pretty good. Um, has anybody used like a, a data binding system on the web or some sort of um, thing that keeps your data up to date for you? Okay. Um, so I guess I was already introduced. Uh, I was kind of the one guy building most of Instagram.com uh, for a long time, and we decided to take a bet on this technology that we were developing internally called React. And um, I really did not like doing front end um, before using React and after using React I like joined the core team and started advocating and building a lot of stuff with it. Um, so that's why I'm here today is because I, I was working on this real world project. I got really excited about how easy it was and how little bugs came out of it. Um, and uh, today we're, we're continuing to, to use React and, and we have a team of three building Instagram. We have um, lots of people, uh, basically all new JavaScript at, at Facebook is being developed with React. Um, and like, like Matt said, I'm a, one of the React contributors now. I don't want to sit here and read the manual to you or talk to you about um, kind of how to build applications with React. I want to kind of show you some of the, the ideas that we had behind React and, and how we build applications at Facebook um, and some of the cool things that fall out of that. So even if you don't end up using React, our goal is to get the ideas of React out there um, and into other systems and projects and organizations. Um, and my thing is not working. Uh, so first, like, what makes UI hard? I've talked to a lot of engineers that are more familiar with kind of back-end development. And they talk about building a data model and then slapping a UI on top of it. Um, has anybody else had that kind of conversation with people before? You just like, oh, like slap some jQuery on the front and like it'll be good to go. It's never that simple. Um, it starts with it just doesn't feel right. That's like the number one thing that comes out of these types of things. You click on this button, then you click on that button, and then you're in this weird state that you didn't expect. Um, so we identified that one of the, the hardest parts about building UIs is managing um, all the state that users see. Um, and by state, state can be anything. State can be stuff that's stored in the DOM. State can be how big the viewport is. State can be like the series of actions that they've performed in the application. Um, and then multiply that by all the stuff that you've been getting in from the server. Uh, and particularly, state changing over time um, is fundamentally evil. Uh, specifically, it's like really hard to reason about what state your application is going to be in over a period of time and actions um, Inter or users and, and server responses interacting with your application. So we need a way to manage this complexity. That's our job as engineers and as, as front end people. We need to manage the complexity of these user interfaces. And they're very complex, um, a lot more complex than it originally meets the eye because our designers design things that look really simple, but actually that simplicity is, is, can be complex, if that makes any sense at all. So the way that you traditionally manage complexity in applications is you build unit tests. So at least you know, when you solve this piece of your application, you write a test and then you never think about it again. Uh, this might be a little controversial, but I don't think the unit tests are particularly effective for front ends. Um, because you can't check the user experience. Um, a really good example is uh, I used to work on the photos team at Facebook on the mobile site. And one day we, we did a code push 
And we started getting bug reports from lots and lots of people saying that photos weren't showing up on the mobile site. All of our tests passed, including unit tests and like Selenium tests. And we looked at our egress graphs for our CDNs and we were like, oh, we're serving all the JPEGs. What's going on? Well, it turned out an intern had committed a line of CSS that set the heights of all the images to zero. Um, in a, I would have never have tested for that in a million years. Um, I actually built a, a test system for Instagram that I'm not talking about today called Huxley, which takes screenshots um, and uses that as part of the test cases, but it's still hard to test UIs. Another thing you can do to try to manage complexity is to perform static analysis. Um, so things like JS hint, JS lint, um, really great for kind of the low level, you know, did you are your semicolons ambiguous kind of things. Uh, but in general, I think that especially compared to the languages where, um, like Haskell, that have really rich static analysis, we're just not there yet in JavaScript. Um, so because of all the complexity of UIs and kind of the immaturity of the tooling that we have, I don't even try to be correct anymore when I build UIs. I embrace the fact that we're going to have bugs and it's not going to feel right, and it's always going to be a battle. Um, because being correct is an exercise in futility. Unless you have a way to, to reason about every single pixel in your application over any possible combination of states, it's going to be really hard. So instead, I just try to be predictable. So I want the same bug to occur um, when I try to reproduce it uh, at HQ that our users are having. Um, I want to be able to run the same series of operations and have everyone get the same result. And by doing that, once I fix a bug, it's going to probably stay fixed, hopefully. So, you guys with me so far? You agree? Okay. Sweet, awesome. Uh, so we identified two silver bullets that really help out, um, really help like make predictable UIs. The first is composition, um, and here's the dictionary definition of composition. It's basically you can make complicated functions out of simpler functions. What that really means is trying to fit, um, you don't have to fit the entire program in your head um, to understand what it's going to do. You can, only, you can put a single piece in your head, think about how this one part of the page or this one subsystem is going to work, and you, you're not worried about breaking other parts of the system because you have things like um, strict interfaces. And when you can kind of only reason about one small part of your application at a time, and that works, it's easier for you to predict what's going to happen. So you look at the inputs to the system, you can think about what the outputs are going to be, and you're not worried about kind of weird cascading changes um, to the rest of your system. Um, that's kind of like programming 101 functions, abstraction, um, nothing too crazy. Uh, the other thing is idempotence. And um, this is the, the definition of idempotence. Basically, for the same set of inputs, um, you're going to get the same set of outputs every time. Um, it's also called referential transparency, but it doesn't really fit on the big font on my slides, so I wrote iMpotence instead. Uh, but the idea is that um, when you can control a set of inputs into your system, you know what the outputs are going to be, and they're going to be the same every time. Again, um, because you can predict the output given um, for a given input, you can get predictable UIs. So what's pretty great about this is that if you use immutable data structures, you'll get idempotence for free. Because nothing is ever actually changing. Your functions become uh, a lot more pure. And um, you know, you're, you're not worried about unconstrained mutation. And unconstrained mutation is actually, I think it's insane. So has anybody um, here either worked on like a highly parallel system or talked to someone who has? Come on, someone has talked to somebody who has used threads before, right? Um, how happy were they when they were working on that system? It's a lot of fun, right? Everyone talks about how easy concurrency and parallelism is. <laughs> um, so it's actually not um, parallelism that's difficult. It's mutation in a parallel system that's difficult. And so just because, um, like the problem's a little simpler when you have a single thread, but unconstrained mutation still makes things really difficult to reason about. Um, so when you're designing UIs in particular that have lots of state that's mutating all the time, we need to focus really, really carefully on minimizing mutable state. Um, I like to call this fully normalized application state. So your state only lives in one place. And when you mutate that state, you only mutate it in one place too. 
So all of the different ways that piece of state can transition within your application um, lives in one kind of module in your program. We call that the owner of that, that mutable state. Um, so React kind of is built on those two principles to, to really encourage users to, to build in that way. Um, so I'm going to give you just kind of the high level sales pitch at this point. And then we'll dive into some examples that demonstrate why these techniques are valuable and kind of the, the cool stuff that falls out of that. So we call it a library for creating user interfaces, which is like this really vague thing that um, everyone interprets differently. Uh, but what's important is it's not a templating system and it's not an MVC framework either. It kind of fills more of a declarative jQuery role. What I mean by that is we don't manage your server communication. We don't manage um, your application state in any sort of meaningful way. Um, you give us your minimal state and we'll convert it into DOM. And we'll handle and we'll give you events that you can then like turn into state transitions. So it's much more like a jQuery and much less like, um, like an Ember or, or something like that. And with React, you're writing idempotent composable functions. I like to call it referentially transparent um, user interface components. Where you've got some data that comes in from your model. So maybe it's JSON, maybe it's like a rich object graph, maybe it's backbone models, um, maybe it's like meteor cursors. Uh, and virtual DOM comes out. And um, you may have heard of the virtual DOM. That's kind of an implementation um, detail of React, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But the key thing is that when the data changes, we simply re-render. So nowhere in your code do you explicitly say, I'm going to change this DOM node, or I'm going to just change this subtree. Instead, you effectively throw out your entire old application state and re-render with a new one. Um, again, it's referentially transparent. It's very easy to follow the data flow. Um, and what React will do is React will take the previous result of your UI and the next result of your UI, diff the two, and apply the minimal set of DOM operations to, to the uh, user interface. Um, so with React, you're basically rendering and re-rendering a virtual DOM. Uh, but it's a little bit uh, broader than that. You're actually rendering a, a view hierarchy to a virtual DOM, but it's not actually a virtual DOM at all. Um, it's some sort of backend. So React is not just for the browser DOM. We have three backends currently in, in production right now, and we're working on a fourth. Um, you can render to a browser DOM. You can render to an HTML string on the client without having a browser DOM. So if you want to run um, in Node.js in production at scale, um, you can't really do that with JS DOM or Phantom JS or something like that because it's just too expensive. But with React, we've built for that out of the box. Um, and that's great for SEO and performance. And we also have backend for um, something that we call art, which is itself backed by um, SVG, VML, and Canvas. So uh, if you go on Facebook, there's like a lot of interactive charts for like our Insights products. Those are built on React, and depending on the browser environment, they'll render to a Canvas um, or to SVG or to VML for IE8. Um, and the fourth back I'm working on is, is uh, what we call a remote browser DOM. What I mean by that is, what if you ran your entire application in a web worker? Then your DOM operations, you don't actually have access to the DOM directly. So what if you just got events over the, serialized events over the wire to the worker and then sent DOM operations to like a remote DOM? So there's just like tons of flexibility here when you design without the browser in mind and just think about it as like a remote engine. Okay. So I'm going to run through a couple of pieces of example code to make this a little more concrete. Again, this is going to be a focus more on like demonstrating the ideas of React rather than, than talking about kind of the best way to build a to-do list application. Um, even though I do have a to-do list application in here, I know grown, but uh, uh, let's see if I can get my displays working here. Displays. Okay, cool. Am I still on? She's losing. Oh, there we go. Cool. Um, can you guys see this okay? Maybe zoom in a little bit. How's that? All right. This is the simplest 
React example that you can come up with. Um, React's API is super small, so there's not that much to learn. Um, we've got this render component call, which basically says, take this virtual DOM tree and stick it into this real DOM tree. We construct a virtual DOM tree with um, these functions right here that create them. So when I mentioned a virtual DOM, I didn't really tell you what that was. It's basically a bunch of descriptors that say, hey, I want this DOM node to be in this place. So this doesn't actually turn into document.create element. This doesn't touch the DOM at all. It actually only returns like a, a naive object that has a set of attributes, um, a set of children, and um, a type attached to it. And so in this case, it would be a div type, h1 type, a p type. So these are very, very cheap to, to instantiate. It's like instantiating an empty dictionary, basically. Um, so we create this. The first parameter would be um, like a like DOM uh, HTML attributes. So you could say like style and it, it just works like that. So this is pretty simple, um, not particularly interesting. Does everybody follow that? Any questions about what just happened? Okay. Um, the host of the meeting suite. Um, okay. So I talked about rendering and re-rendering to a virtual DOM. Here's an example of that in action. Um, let's start at the beginning. So every every 1,000 milliseconds, I'm going to be re-rendering to the virtual DOM. And what this and so I'm just calling this render callback right here. What render does is render just calls react.render component over and over with the same style of uh, virtual DOM that I showed you in the previous example. Um, the difference is we're basically calling new date.toString here. And every time react.render uh, component gets called, it looks at that DOM node and it says, hey, does the React component currently exist in here? Yes or no? If not, it creates a new one for you. If it does, it does what we call reconciliation and updates that uh, virtual DOM for you. So you can see that I'm rendering, I'm basically rendering like what looks like a new text input every 1,000 milliseconds. But if I type in here, um, you know, my cursor position is saved. That piece of DOM is not being touched at all. I can prove this to you by highlighting this. And my highlight state stays, which means that it's the same DOM node still there. Just that part of the text is being updated. Um, you buy that this is just touching the minimal set of DOM nodes that need to be touched without like flame graphs and stuff like that? OK. <laughs> cool. Um, so this gets to more of our kind of real API. So that was you know, like a very simple um, example of, of how you would use React at, at kind of for small things. But really, when you're building an application, sometimes you need to know, you know hey, my, my component was added to the DOM, or my component was removed from the DOM, or I want to get the raw DOM node attached to this virtual DOM node. Um, and for that, we use this um, React component API. So we can say react.create class. And this is a little clicker example. So when I click this, it, it increments. Um, like I said, I'm not trying to teach you how to use apps, so I'm not going to go through this line by line. But the point is, um, this component's a state machine. So um, we know exactly what the initialized state of the component's going to be because we just look at this get initial state method, which is a React hook. We also know where all of the state transitions are going to happen in this application because we just search for the word set state. And this is the only way that you can transition state in your application and the only way that you can mutate data. Um, if you follow our rules. So if you're in a, um, so when I'm debugging a React application, it's actually really simple. Um, if the behavior is weird, I just like grep for set state. And almost 100% of the time, the bug is with a state transition. Um, and because React forces you into this mindset of like, oh, this is the minimal state representation of my application, and this is every place where it gets transitioned, it's really easy for you to hunt down bugs and find them. So normally when you're building React components, um, you first like make your render methods look good, which return that virtual DOM representation. And then um, when there's bugs, you either had too much state or your state transition was wrong. Um, normally like your actual rendering code is pretty, pretty stable. Um, 
So uh, this example also demonstrates event handling. So you can add an attribute, a non-click attribute, to a virtual DOM node, and that will um, dispatch a click event for you. Now, I have to like reiterate that this is not a real DOM node. So it's not attaching an inline click hand event handler to a real DOM node. We have a whole virtual event system that, like, you get HTML5 events for free in IE8 kind of situation because we normalize everything to the W3C spec. And part of that is we use a technique called event delegation. Um, um, are you guys familiar with that? You listen to events on like the window or the document and you dispatch them. So we do that for free. So this is actually using that um, out of the box. Um, and you can see that we, we no, in no place do we explicitly update this count. Um, we just basically render it into the virtual DOM right here. Um, and React takes care of updating that for us. So where is my presentation at? So I talked a lot about kind of the item potent or referentially transparent parts of React just there. You saw that we, we have like a state machine that gives us like our minimum state of our application and emits a full UI as a, uh, as a function based on that. Um, so let's look at the other piece of the puzzle that I talked about, which is composition. So here's your stereotypical kind of to-do list example. Um, it works. And uh, I'm trying to, to not dive too deeply in here, but we have our render method here, which returns the virtual DOM representation of the component. <laughs> Where we render some divs and we render some H3s, and then we call this to-do list component. Um, this to-do list component is actually defined up here um, with react.createClass. What's important here is that you're no longer thinking in terms of divs and spans and H1s. You can build a language of components that represents your problem domain. So a lot of times when I'm building applications on the Facebook stack, for example, um, I'm not writing any HTML. I'm writing very little. Instead, I'm saying profile pic. And that profile pic lives inside a media object container. And then the content of the media object is um, emphasized text or something like that. Um, or uh, actually, a really good example is mentions text. So that's text that users could have um, at mentioned somebody in, and we link, that their, we link their username, and we show like a little flyout when they mouse over it. Um, so composition is like really key to managing complexity. And like React is, I think, one of the few kind of popular JavaScript frameworks that really emphasizes composition on top as like the way to solve problems. All right. Lastly, JSX. Um, anybody here seen JSX before? So uh, who here thinks it's the best idea ever? All right, all right, we got some people on board. So this is an example. This is the same code that you just saw, but using JSX. And we basically have a fork of Esprima that can parse inline. Um, they look like E for X um, XML literals inside of uh, JavaScript code, but it just turns them into function calls. Um, so in the previous version, we had like React.dom.div, and to save you some typing, you just write div like that, and it works with with user-defined components as well. Um, so this is actually just kind of like a nice little syntax extension, but it's completely optional um, to use with React. And we actually use it for some things that are non-React at Facebook as well. Um, and if you want to play around with it, we have this tool. It's not really linked to, from a very good place, but you can like live edit JSX code and see how it transforms. Um, so you can see like when I type a span, uh, it just turns into a function call to span with no um, attributes. And if I want to say, like, um, it just adds that literal in there. It's a pretty simple transform. That's all it does. OK. So um, I want to go into kind of what makes uh, React's particular implementation really awesome. And that's expressivity and static analysis. So because we emphasize um, composition uh, and referential transparency, uh, we create UIs that are like relatively, um, I think it's like 
kind of harder to write bugs in React than it is um, in, in other systems that encourage mutation all over the place. Uh, but we built the API that we wanted, and we think that we built like one of the most expressive UIs for building, or one of the most expressive APIs for building user interfaces out there. Uh, and I'll show you why. So if there's one thing to take away from, from React, it's that we've kind of laid the groundwork with these good first principles for building reliable UIs, and then we wanted to give you like literally the most power we can possibly give you as a front end engineer, um, with absolutely no respect for existing like like techniques. Um, so putting HTML in your JavaScript, like we're totally cool with that. Requiring people to use JavaScript, like that's um, something that we're totally committed to. So here is a good um, example of that. Uh, I know that this is probably like the worst user interface you've ever seen. Um, but the, this is supposed to be a list of, that consumes two data streams um, and renders a UI based on it. And I've added this like set interval um, to demonstrate kind of the reactive updates. So um, we tried to actually make this somewhat realistic to the Facebook use case. So um, let me see here. So I, I have this function make random that generates a bunch of fake uh, user data. But imagine you pull down from the server a list of your friends and a list of your followers. And your, your friends and followers object have a name, string, um, have an is favorite, so have you favorited that user? Um, like put a star next to their name. Is verified, so like Justin Bieber's account has a little check mark next to it. Uh, and you know they have a certain number of followers. Okay, this is like a, a pretty, um, it's, obviously it's like reduced from our use case, but it's pretty realistic representation of the type of data we get back. So what we want to do uh, with React is we want to combine the friends and the followers that we get from the server we want to only look at our favorite users. And then we want to sort them by the follow count, take the top 10, and then if the person is a verified account, uppercase their name, and then highlight them in yellow. And we want to be able to, to receive updates from the server in real time and, and keep this data up to date. So, what this, so you see these jumping around. It's basically adding a random number of followers to each user in the list. Um, for every second. And some pieces of data are like that. They're like real time. We're getting WebSocket pushes, that kind of thing. Um, all this stuff uh, down here is, is kind of like just scaffolding code. Um, and this is the FPS counter. So what's, what's important to look at here is that we're just using regular JavaScript data structures. Um, my make random function returns a, an array of JavaScript objects, just like you would get from the server, like a JSON API. Um, and we're using our friends, concatenate, uh, filter, sort, slice, map. We're doing, the point of this example is to show that like, we're doing whatever sorts of transforms we want in JavaScript with our libraries. Um, and then we're just emitting a result that React will diff for us. Um, you really start to appreciate this when you look at like a, a traditional data binding system. So I used JSBin here because I couldn't get it to work in um, uh, JS Fiddle. And I'm trying to not talk about performance right now, but my browser's frozen. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, the reason why it's, it's slow is because I'm, we're looking at 10,000 um, people right now. So, so this is this, like roughly the same UI, uh, or at least as close as I could get it. And... I built it in Ember, which is kind of, I think, like one of the most high quality traditional data binding systems out there. Um, and they're also doing a lot of cool work with, with performance as well. So if I wanted to build the same UI, uh, well, let's look at the template first. We have to use kind of the, the directives that the, the template language has given us. So we get each and we get if in the template. So we, we put some of our logic over here in the template and, oh, well, thank, thank goodness they gave us bind adder so we could put like a class name on a node. But we have to, to do a lot of work over here in the, the model as well. So here's our computed property here. We get the friends. We concatenate it with the followers. We do the filter. We do the sort. We do the slice. Um, that's kind of, you know, they've re-implemented a lot of the list APIs um, for Ember. But this is the part that starts to get you. 
So when I actually first built this application, um, I had a bug. Because it seemed to me that like this would be the right way to do a computed property. Um, I say, hey, this is a computed property. Like I'm calling my getters in here. It should figure it out for me. Um, but if you forget a certain piece of data, then you actually render inconsistent UIs. So this is, um, you know, it's rendering most of it consistently, but it's not doing the sorting. Um, so I'm like a really sloppy engineer. So I would have just been like, oh yeah, it's rendering. Okay, I'm gonna go push it to production, and then like I would get this bug report back, and I'd have to be like, oh, I have to, I forgot to put this um, tracking comment in here. This is not to rail on Ember, because Ember is a project that focuses on user experience um, and really, I think, nails it in a lot of ways. But if a project that is so high quality and has great people on it and is focusing on user experience has these problems, I think that means that the fundamental idea of fine-grained tr change tracking is problematic. Now, what do I mean when I say fine-grained change tracking? I talked about referentially transparent UIs, where you take in some data and you return a value that then gets diffed um, and renders to a DOM. With change tracking, you actually subscribe to callbacks in your, um, at some place under the hood, you subscribe to callbacks when your data changes. So when I call um, set down here, Ember, uh, through these hints that, that I've given it and through hints that uh, Handlebars has inferred, sets up a, a data flow graph inside of Ember. And so when you call set, it triggers a series of callbacks throughout the system that, um, that eventually result in keeping your UI up to date. You follow so far? Um, so the point of this is that maintaining that data flow graph isn't free from a performance and understanding perspective. Um, and this is kind of the, the state of the art right now in, in data binding is to, to, at some point under the hood, whether you're Meteor, Knockout, Backbone, Ember, you're, you're maintaining this data flow graph. Uh, and there's a lot of um, usability um, kind of problems that come along with it. And we actually had our own data flow graph solution called um, Bolt.js at Facebook for a long time. And we ended up like, this, this thing always just gets more and more complicated until eventually it's just, it's another barnacle in the hull that slows you down. Um, okay. Oh, and the other thing is that um, when you're building these data flow systems, a lot of times you have to put um, string, like, key names and strings or have special expressions and you can't lint those. And you can't um, minify those with closure compiler advanced mode. Um, so when you stick in JavaScript world, things are easy. When you start reinventing um, data binding systems, it gets significantly harder. Um, okay. So um, how much time do I have left? Like 10, 15, okay. So I wanted to, to, to show you some of the, the kind of cool stuff that falls out of building with this kind of referentially transparent, immutable mindset. Uh, so I, I picked Meteor just because I had some Meteor examples lying around from a previous talk. Um, and also, it's kind of a good example that like, we didn't build any bindings to Meteor. We just like, you know, received its data and, and did reactive updates. Um, whoops. Um, so the first thing I'll do is show you a basic game with Meteor. Uh, so I built a basic um, kind of domain logic or model with, with Meteor. Um, and kind of ignore the Meteor stuff, because I'm sure that you guys have your own data access libraries that might look something like this. Maybe they don't, um, but it's pretty easy to understand how it works. Um, they have a collection. You find a, a board object by name, uh, and you create a new one if it doesn't exist. Uh, and then we have a move method where you can say, I'm going to put my spot here on the, on the board. Um, and then we have a, a getter, and then we have a way to reset the board. This, this should be not super interesting. So if I go in my console, I've got this board instance that I created in my app. And I can say board move zero, zero. And then when I say get zero, zero, 
and says, oh, you put an X there. Now, if I try to move there again, oops, it'll throw. And if I go to 0, 1, and I get there, it'll be an O. OK, it's a very simple domain. It, this is supposed to be an example of just like general business logic of your application. Um, so let's render it with React. And then kill it, restart it. Actually, I don't want to reset it. So, um, if it loads. So this is the board rendered with React. Uh, it's rendering like nine divs. And I put in this file for NJS. So I have a function render board like I had showed you before. And it takes in that whole board object as a, as a parameter. Um, and again, like board is whatever object like you define. It's just a regular JavaScript object. Um, we iterate through all the rows. We iterate through all the columns. We get the value at the row and the column. Uh, if the value is x, we give it a certain CSS class name. If the value is o, we give it a certain CSS class name. If the cell is empty, we give it another class name. And then we just, um, again, using regular JavaScript arrays, which I'm really familiar with, uh, I push a, a new div on there um, with the class name that I want. Okay, this example isn't using JSX or components because I want you guys not to focus on, um, on like, oh, look at how easy it is to build apps with React, but more like, here's what referential transparency, um, transparent UIs look like with domain logic. And then for, for every row, we group them in a div. And then we just return another div. Man, this is like the most unsemantic app ever. But uh, we, we return another div um, containing everything. And, and this is how this is what comes out. Um, so, oh, and one other thing. Let me. Uh, this is this is our like entry point to our application. And um, Meteor gives us this API that says call this function whenever data has changed. So we just call basically call render component um, with the board whenever the the data changes in the board. Does that make sense? Uh, this is kind of like a meteor specific thing. Um, but just whenever you get a server response back, just like re-render. Um, so if I do that, reactively renders. Um, again, if I like mutate the DOM myself, like that, and then I, I move to this place, that DOM isn't touched at all. So, uh, so that's pretty cool. Like we we now basically bound a model to our user interface in one direction. So our data is flowing from from Meteor to our business logic to the UI, and we haven't set up any manual binding within our user interface anyway. So let's add interactivity. It's a fancy word for event handling. So now, when I click the event, or when I click this, the, the board, it's showing X's and O's. I think red is X and blue is O, because it shows up better. Um, and the code is actually completely unchanged in the, in the board and in this, this kind of entry point. So here's our, remember our render board function which rendered the, the UI? We're still just taking in the board as a, um, as a parameter. We're doing all the same stuff except we added this click handler here. And all we do is say, um, call the move method with our current um, row and column that we're rendering to. Um, so this uses like JavaScript bind. We didn't have to come up with any magic way of like flowing data throughout the application. Just call bind with the current position, and then React will call that function for you um, when it's clicked. We also have this reset button that does the same thing. Um, make sense? Okay. So that works pretty well. 
So now I'm going to, that, that's all kind of like basically setting up the app. Um, let's do some cool stuff with it. So I don't actually use Meteor for real projects because I'm like a little, I don't really know how it works. So I want to be able to swap out my back end at any time. Uh, See, so yeah, I don't even know how Meteor works, so I reset it every time just because I'm at like a demo and who knows what's going to happen. Uh, so here's what I did. I rewrote the board to have nothing, um, nothing to do with Meteor. So the only difference here is because Meteor isn't calling us whenever the data changes, I register an onChange handler, or I have an onChange callback that's passed to it. Um, but it's the same. You know, same methods. Uh, it's just kind of like a regular JavaScript application. It fits in like a single screen. And because I changed the board implementation, um, I changed the um, the Meteor implementation a little bit too. Uh, we basically just construct the board and we pass it that render callback. So whenever some data changes in the board, we we notify React. Um, you could just as easily implement this with Backbone. Um, if you, uh, there's ways that you can get it performant enough to, to just do this on every animation frame. That's what the closure script guys do. Uh, that's another topic. But the important thing is that this code didn't change at all, the React code. Even though we're using an entirely different way of binding, um, you know, we swapped, if we had swapped in Backbone, we would have to rewrite everything to use events. If we swapped in Knockout, we would have to, you know, use their observables. Um, but with React, since it does this diff algorithm, it doesn't care where your data comes from. Um, so we didn't have to change your UI at all. And uh, I didn't want Firefox, I wanted Chrome. And it still works. Uh, the only difference is that the data isn't persisted between reloads now. I mentioned that we have multiple backends for React. One of the problems when you adopt JavaScript at scale and build real applications, I think probably especially for Yahoo, since you guys build a lot of public content, um, is SEO. So if there's no actual content in the HTTP response, then Google's going to penalize you because it has to evaluate JavaScript. And it uses that as a heuristic to indicate that your site is slow. So um, wouldn't it be great if we could take the exact same code um, that we wrote before and just server render it. Um, so I took the exact same code as before. Presentation mode is now enabled. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's all good. Um, so let, let's look at the original version here, which uses Meteor. Um, so I, I filled in that square there. I want to refresh this. Um, it's not there. Well, I don't know why. Anyway, um, so this is my the source of my Meteor application, uh, and it's like kind of nothing there, right? There's all this JavaScript, but my source of this application or this page, sorry. Uh, is the actual HTML used to render. Now, the, the reason why the Meteor update didn't, um, didn't render to React is because I have a bug where I'm creating multiple games for each window. Um, but the point is, if it's reading from the same data source, you can generate static HTML um, from React and render it just like to, you can either render it just to Google or you can render it um, for your initial page loads for your users. And React actually has this great um, feature where when you call render component and you give it a DOM node, it inspects the DOM node and it looks to see uh, if this data React checksum is there attribute. Um, so see that, that data attribute right there? If that data attribute's there and the checksum is valid, then it won't actually touch the DOM at all on boot. 
So what you can do is you can serve a static page to your users, which pops up like pretty much instantly. And then when your JavaScript finishes downloading, it'll like adopt that markup for you. So if you have a photo page and someone starts typing a comment on the photo and the JavaScript hasn't downloaded yet, um, when the JavaScript does download, it's not going to erase the comment that they, they typed in. Um, and for us at Facebook, like those are the types of problems where like comment boxes randomly reset that actually affect our metrics and we measure. So this is kind of like a required feature for React at Facebook. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty elegant architecture. Um, so we can also do uh, instant replay, too. So um, I've this is our, our same front end we've had the whole time. There's no changes here, except I added an instant replay button. Um, and I, where's the replay? Oh, that's magical. Um, so all, all we do is, is render the same UI like we always have. Let's look at the entry point here. Uh, so what we do here is every time our UI changes, we hold on to an instance of the previous board. And then when we click on, um, on the replay button, we just re-render every second with um, each of the previous boards until we get to the end of the array. So it's really simple. We're, we're back in Meteor World with this auto run stuff. Um, but when replay is clicked, we just say, OK, every second, render component, render board with the previous board. So if I do that, then it's the replay. That's pretty cool. Um, and you can, um, if you can come up with a representation using immutable data, uh, you can get that stuff for free. Um, and if you can use something called persistent data structures, which are immutable data structures that um, share unchanged references with their previous versions, this is actually unbelievably cheap. Uh, and when you get this, you can do um, other things for free, too. So since we have a log of actions and we can play them and fast forward them and rewind them, it's really easy to build a collaborative app, right? Just basically um, send all the, the state transitions, which you know about in React because it's a set state call, and just send them over WebSockets to each other. Um, it also has some really cool implications for tracking down bugs. So a lot of times we'll get bug reports at Facebook where someone's like, photos don't work. Or like, oh, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so imagine it for a second if we logged all of the React state transitions in the application, or a meaningful subset of them. And then when the user clicked on the report bug button, we zip those up, sent them to, and attach them to the bug report. Then an engineer can pull those down and replay them and reproduce the bugs like just as the user had. This is the type of thing that is like so difficult to do when you're either tied to the browser or um, when you don't embrace like the minimal mutable state in your application and really, really try to push that mutation out to the edges. Uh, okay. And you guys are probably wondering about performance. Um, it's really fast. Uh, and performance probably fills up a whole other talk. But um, if it comes up in questions or talking afterwards, um, I can. I can show you some cool stuff. Uh, thank you, guys. That's about all I have to say. So. Any questions for Pete? Step up to the mic here. Feel free to shout them out. Go ahead and repeat the question. Yep. Hello. Um, hey. So this might be a little bit not what you'd expect, but in your Chrome browser, you had an extra tab that said React. Is that an extension that you guys built to help you debug React, or? That, I totally, I always forget that, like, we have this. <laughs> um, here, I'm going to show you, show you something cool. So we have a Chrome extension for React. Uh, so let's, like, so, yeah. <laughs> um, so you can inspect element here. Uh, and so this is your normal DOM, right? And by the way, these IDs got a lot smaller in the, in the latest version, so don't get too scared. Um, so there's a React tab. And you'll notice 
Rather than looking at divs and spans, I'm looking at my full page root, my desktop p page, we call the photo page the p page, the page Chrome, uh, and then like we've got blue bar, and we've got, look, a vertical center component. Like you don't have to figure out how to vertically center something anymore. Oh my god. Um, responsive container, so we have something that maintains a fixed aspect ratio for stuff like this. Um, that's just media query, that's not React. Uh, but I tried to find this last time and I couldn't, but let me see if I can. All right, so here in this right-hand column right here, there's props and state. So remember I talked about there's parameters you can pass into a component. Those are called props for properties. And then there's also that state machine component of a, of a component. We call that state. Um, but because we have a minimal representation of state in our application, I can change viewer has like to false, and suddenly this button no longer shows up, and I don't show up in this list anymore. However, if I change it to true, I'm back in the list, and, uh, whoops, oh my god. And my, my button shut up there. And you know, you can kind of traverse the hierarchy and stuff like that too. So. All right, thank you. Sure. Oh, yeah, sorry. He asked um, what was the React tab in the, the developer tools. So, my question is about the, the mobile performance. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure the part of the DOM is really the same uh, across like desktop and, and mobile, so mm -hmm. I guess it's pretty fast also. But uh, especially for our namespaces, uh, they're not good for compression. So is it like the payload uh, very high when you have like huge pages like these type of pages is, is pretty simple in relation to the Facebook page itself? So. The question was about the mobile footprint of React? Yeah, that's okay. right. Okay. Uh, so React is closure compiler advanced mode compatible. So I think that that brings it down to around 20 or 25K. Um, without that, it's about 30K uh, of just JavaScript downloaded. Um, what's interesting about React is when you specify, so you saw how you specify the DOM with function calls? That means your actual DOM gets minified by the JavaScript minifier. So um, you're actually not shipping down as many bytes of, of markup because you don't have markup. You only have function calls, which we already know how to statically analyze and minify. So um, your actual payload with React will be pretty small. Um, the thing that really gets us mostly on mobile devices is memory usage. And um, really, like you're, if you want to use some sort of system that keeps your UI up to date, you're going to have to trade some memory usage to, to keep track of that stuff. The trade-off that we've done is we keep your previously rendered result and your next rendered result, and we diff those, right? Um, what's interesting is that um, naively is, is an O of N algorithm. You can optimize it to O of log N. Uh, but what's interesting is that N there is the size of the stuff that you've rendered to the DOM, not the size of your total data model. So um, for example, with like a, a change tracking approach like Embers, um, it's very easy for you to track the changes of your entire data model. So when I was rendering 10,000 people, it was setting up 10,000 callbacks. Um, with React, I only rendered 10 people, so it only kept the tree representation of the 10 people rendered to the UI. Uh, so we found that that has been the right trade-off for us. Um, like anything, you can just drop into raw DOM API and manage it yourself, and it'll be more performant. Uh, but good luck managing the complexity of your application if you are just, it's effectively like writing assembler. So. Uh, second question about Mobile 2. Uh, do you have support for like touch events, uh, this kind of stuff, and CSS animations? Uh, have you played with that? Mm -hmm. The question was, do we have support for touch events or CSS animations? We have a component called uh, React CSS Transition Group, which is part of um, our add-ons package, which uh, is very similar. If you've used Angular, there's a, a great library called ng animate um, that is kind of, it's really easy for like when a, an item gets added to a list, fade it in and fly it out and that kind of thing. So we have that. Um, other than that, kind of animation is usually expressed in terms of either like adding a class name with state or animating a property with state. Uh, and I can show you some examples afterwards because um, I can't project my phone. Um, that, are, that are pretty cool. Uh, the other question was, um, 
is CSA the name? Yeah, touch events. Touch events. Oh, yeah, we, we have full support for touch events. We actually have a synthetic event system. Um, so you're not listening to the real touch events. You're listening to re like fake React touch events. So we can actually dispatch tap events. And um, we actually have an implementation of like you know, touch responders where if you have two stacked touchable areas on top of each other, which one gets the event? We have a system for reconciling that too. Thanks. Coming in 0 0.10. Uh, I'm really interested in the uh, static uh, page generation stuff. So uh, one thing is, I, I think it's awesome that you can do that on the server, and then you get, then you're in this mode where you're getting updates from the server, and then you're able to synchronize this thing. I, I get that. What I'm curious about is, can you, um, you know, so I have like a lot of information coming from my server, and it's all in JSON, for example. And instead of sending that, it's impossible for React to help me with just sending back just uh, HTML fragments that I need, and you know, using the same kind of DOM, you know, um, stuff that you're doing this virtual DOM on this backend. So mm -hmm. if that's not clear, you just like. So I, I think I get what you're saying. You're saying that like by sending down the HTML and the JSON, you're kind of sending the data down twice, right? Uh, yeah. Well. That's true. Um, it's also like, you know, so the first time it's not so bad, and the second time you're getting a whole bunch of JSON, but you don't really need all of that information. You just need a subset, right? So, yeah. um, so yeah. the, the question, the, the question was, um, with server rendering, you have to send down all the JSON needed to initialize your application, and uh, is there a way that you can avoid that? So since React encourages you to build with the minimum set of application state possible, uh, if you're building correctly, that is the minimum um, set of state required to serialize your entire application. So if you're imagining you have like 10,000 users that you're sending down um, from the server, you might say, hey, that's like a bunch of unnecessary information if I'm only rendering 10. Um, well, that's actually not true because you haven't designed your application to express those concerns. So if you really only want to render the first 10, you should accept only the first 10 um, as a property and then build a feature that basically fetches from the server um, to get the remaining data that you need. Um, um, so I think then, so if I, so I've kind of done that step. And um, so then I have like, um, basically what I'm, what I'm getting at is it could be that after all these changes that happen, the only thing that I need is, you know, um, the actual changes would be really small, or you know, the changes would be better compressed as HTML um, than it could be as JSON. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where I'm coming from. From a, this is kind of a far off, but kind of a something that comes up when considering switching from like a large application that's concerned about these things already. Yeah. So I'm just curious if there's a way to get because it's really cool that it does the like DOM uh, rendering server side or the you know static page rendering. Mm -hmm. It'd be really really cool. Um, I think that the only thing that I see that was like. That I didn't see that wasn't there. That's everything that's awesome is that, like just getting a partial part of the DOM, like and inserting that into a, a part from, uh, like because that's the, the server decided to change. So it just since that, it's already. I see. Yeah. So, so the question was actually like partial loading of, of applications. Yeah, of like HTML instead of like all of your. Yeah. Right, as HTML. So. So we can do this actually today. Um, we have a system on Facebook called Pagelets where we like stake out boxes on the page and we have them load asynchronously. Uh, you can have component state and you, you can have a component called like a pagelet which says, which has a piece of state set that says loaded is false or true. And then you can have um, that component kick off a new instance of React inside of it um, and get that capability. So what you would do is you would basically say, okay, um, this component is going to um, initialize to loaded equals false. So you're going to get a fast page load with a bunch of empty divs. Then each of those components will say, oh, I, I was mounted into the page. I'm going to go do a server request and pull down the HTML and the JavaScript concurrently. Um, right, and that would be like a responsibility of your packaging system as well. Um, so you would like lazy load a JavaScript module and, and server render the page. When that server rendered response comes back, you can just set that as your HTML. And then when your JavaScript module loads, you can boot up the React component and render into that HTML. Um, so you can build that with React. It's not really like out of the box, but I think that that implementation, if you have like your async module loader and um, some sort of Ajax call library, um, would probably be like 30 lines of code in React. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, Thanks guys. <laughs>
Alright.